Hello, everybody, and welcome to your Facebook Friday Chatbot Chat. I'm Virginia Nessie, and this is a very special edition of Chatbot Chat. I'm joined by Isaac Rudensky, um, the founder of Adventure Media. You will probably recognize his face as the instructor of the Mobile Monkey Chatbot Masterclass, um, and generally just smart guy when it comes to creating an agency, building bots, bot strategy, and I'm really, really excited that you are our guest here today. Thank you, Isaac, for joining the program. Thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. Every, every event we've done together with you and Larry has been really fun, very insightful, great group of people, and um, I just love keeping, I love keep coming back as long, as long as I get invited back, and yeah, I'll, I'll keep coming back. So thank you. Yes, awesome. This topic, um, I set an invite to the group uh, of, you know, what do you want to hear about in Chatbot Chat? Because we do this every week, and I like to, you know, try to cover what people want to hear about as the community of, you know, bot Facebook Chatbot builders. And there is just far and away a ton of demand for understanding selling of bot services. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people who are running their own agency or are freelancers, and so. Um, I see the comments already. Are we going live? Are we starting soon? Yes, yes, here we are with Isaac. So Isaac, do you know anything about selling bots? Um, <laughs> I, I know a little bit about it. I know a little bit about it. Um, so my background just briefly is uh, I, I run Adventure Media. We're a digital agency based in New York. Um, we're a fully in-house team. And over the last year, year and a half, we've been really getting involved with building bots for clients. Um, it falls right under the scope of what we've always been doing, which is digital paid advertising services. And while bot building is not specifically a paid domain, um, it's highly relevant because one of the most effective ways of using bots is connecting a bot to a click to messenger Facebook ad campaign, which as most people know, tends to be cheaper. The, the cost per acquisition tends to be cheaper than um, in other 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 forms of Facebook ads, and there's a number of reasons for that. One, it's it's a newer ad format. Um, two is unless you're redirecting uh, a, um, somebody out of Facebook, which you're typically not. Um, as long as you're staying within Messenger, um, you're really keeping people in the Facebook ecosystem, and Facebook knows how to find value for every minute of time somebody's on Facebook or on a Facebook product, so they like that. Um, um, so the systems are probably awarding. Advertisers using that mess that that campaign type with um, lower than average rates, let's say for for a thousand impressions or a click or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, so uh, we sell bot building services to clients now, and it's been going very well. And our clients love the bots; they love using Mobile Monkey. They, they love um, they love the it's it's just a new frontier, and that's the the bulk of the excitement. So when you're selling bots to to clients, it's really worth focusing on that. It's like, and I and I do that in every pitch. It's like, listen, this is new. Okay, all of a sudden that's exciting. Like, and that's something which, by the way, happens to work in headlines. News um, is something popularized by David Ogilvy and Claude Hopkins, um, and uh, they did a lot of testing around this. When you when you convey something is new or exciting, it could be a new product or a new way to use a product. And this is, by the way, just regular advice for your own headlines. You um, you really pique the attention of potential customers. So so that's the first thing it's new. It's new, it's exciting. Now you you, you talk about the opportunity where you know you have uh, what did Larry say last time? I don't know, 10 million, 100 million uh, business pages on Facebook. We got 100,000 Facebook Messenger bots in use and um, it's it's Facebook Messenger bots are being rapidly adopted but 1% or a fraction of 1% of of businesses on Facebook are using actual Facebook bots and sophisticated bots. So it's a it's a huge opportunity, and then you talk about um, the engagement rates from these bots, right? Like you send out an email campaign. I just did a webinar this morning, where I should have been I should have been signing people up to the webinar through um, my, my Mobile Monkey Facebook bot, but just because I don't have I didn't have time this past week to set that up, but um, I had like a ten percent attendance rate, which is totally normal for like an email based webinar funnel. 10, 15, 20% is pretty good, but most people who sign up for a webinar, especially if it's a, you know, a week in advance, they're not showing up to the live webinar. So like 10 to 20% attendance rates is pretty normal. And that's because email open rates and engagement rates are really low. And and um, listen, marketers, marketers kill everything, right? We take every good tool and we make it really, really bad for most people because we profit, we profit and we, we, we approach 
any good opportunity as a uh, as an opportunity for growing as our an business. opportunity yeah. as an opportunity as we should as we should and that's how and that's at a high level really how innovation is driven because email became a really bad tool for communication from a marketing perspective because everyone was doing it and there's so much spam and and that part of that created a void for something new and you have platforms like Facebook Messenger and other social media tools and other ways of marketing so like the fact that marketers will good marketers will jump on something and squeeze every ounce of value out of it is also outside of it you know it, it, it creates a shelf life um, you know at least and I'm not saying emails dead it's not dead um, but like how great of an opportunity of it maybe has a shelf life and but it's also that same cycle of you know the food chain that just creates more and more opportunity for growth and innovation and and creates more useful tools for marketers which is awesome but anyway so like Facebook Messenger bots you'll get um, an 80 percent 90 percent open rate engagement rate click-through rate which is unreal and like you you shouldn't believe me unless you see that yourself and you should try that yourself because if somebody told that to me I wouldn't believe it um, because like what what marketing platform could give you a 90% open rate um, and a 75, 85% engagement rate. Like, no, it doesn't exist. So you have to go build a bot, follow this, follow the techniques, read, read a bunch of Virginia's posts and Larry's posts on how to create effective bots. Um, and you'll see for yourself that it's unbelievably effective. And that's something you convey to your clients. And it's like, you drum up all this excitement about it. And then it's like, I'm so excited. Here's my credit card. Let's build a bot. You know, like that's really how you sell these bots. You really take advantage of the fact that it's new. You take advantage of, of that most marketers aren't using it. It's going to be a leg up on their competition. If you could find three, four of your clients' competitors that aren't using bots and you could show them that, um, that's huge, right? Because anything that you could show a client that they could do that could help crush the competition, it's automatic excitement points. Um, and you build up that excitement. You build up the newness of it. You build up the potential results. You show your clients. Um, I, last time I gave a, a summit at the at the Mobile Monkey Virtual Summit, I, I walked um, everybody through how to build a, a spreadsheet that compares the potential results of a giveaway campaign with a Facebook bot versus a non-giveaway campaign. Um, in giveaways, contests, anything that's like engaging like that, at least in my experience, I'm only talking from my experience, um, has been the most effective ways of building bots for our clients. Um, and you could show clients a predictive outlook of like how much more effective these types of campaigns with messenger bots are going to be. Um, and and that, that's meaning what, what I'm getting at is, is I haven't really got into like the numbers yet of like, okay, what do you actually charge? How do you actually charge? Because that, that's very secondary. Because if you set yourself up right, you could really charge whatever you want. Um, and you, if you set, if you, if you, if you hit the setup right and the pitch right, and like this is a, this is exciting, this is a new opportunity. There's all these, you know, it's just it's it's so wide open. There's so much that could happen here. Um, you, if you get that point right, you could charge them six times what you'd be able to charge them if you didn't get the pitch right. So, um, in my opinion, it's that's more important. Sounds like key to the pitch is having a lot of excitement. You know, knowing that you you can bring a lot of value and being able to show that. Um, there's a question, you know, I think something that comes up a lot is, um, do I have to, how do I demonstrate that value? Um, and I think that it kind of lends to finding a niche or a niche for your services. So that way that you can create a few, um, demos or even like build out like a mock-up of a bot so that you can show proof of concept, um, kind of like you said, like, hey, your competitors aren't doing this. Look at how engaging this is and what this could be yours, um, which this is all tying like kind of together. But like if you have a niche, then you can have that demo, then you can pitch that industry and um, and get become an expert in it, really kind of like show the value there. Definitely. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the niche approach to 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 marketing your own agency. Um, as well as working on like specific demos for clients in a specific niche. Like, um, you don't, I don't, you don't necessarily want to go too specialized. Like I know some agencies will like specialize in marketing for dentists. Well, okay. Okay. If that works for you, then, then great for us. Like people ask me all the time, like, why don't I do SEO? Why don't I, why don't I, why don't I do organic social? Like these all fall under the online marketing umbrella. Well, it's like, yeah, well, first of all, we're not an, we're not a one-stop shop marketing company where, uh, an advertising agency. So we do paid media online. It's what we do. 
Um, it's what we like, it's what we're good in. And a lot of clients have told us over the years that like they, they came to us and what part of our appeal to them was that we were specifically, um, we specifically identified as a paid media agency, an advertising agency. We weren't a one-stop shop online marketing company. I mean, they like that. People people do tend to want to work with specialists. Um, and I think that's a pretty common universal thing. So if you could specialize, even if you're just specializing in bot building, like that could be a very positive thing. Like, yeah, we we're we you know, we don't do PPC, we don't do um influencer marketing. We are really good at building Facebook bots and we build the best bots, we make the best bot campaigns. Um, that That's a good specialty, yeah. That's definitely a good specialty. Thanks for that. I got a ton of questions from mm -hmm. our community. I pulled them all together um, and they kind of fall into a few different categories like how do I find clients? Um, so let me read. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there's also one. how do you pitch services and how what are some standard pricing and packages before I get ahead of myself okay, um, okay here's a question um, from Scott Davidson uh, I've been attempting to target local restaurants because I think they could benefit from being proactive and having uh, reactive bot support but no one seems to be biting um, no maybe I'm not selling it. <laughs> actually it's <was> pretty clever <laughs> Uh, am I not selling the value enough or community communicating correctly? Um, they think that they're just going to keep doing traditional marketing like uh, advertising in the local newspaper, emailing. Um, but uh, do you have any ideas on, you know, so it sounds like they've already got their industry in mind, um, but they're having trouble uh, generating the excitement factor and maybe mm -hmm. uh getting in front of the right person. Okay. So there's a couple different things there on that element. Um, there's there's building the actual bot and how the bot in functions and what it does and what it promises and all that. But then there's also um, who you're targeting. Let's say you're running a Facebook ads campaign. Those are two totally separate categories. But I don't, I never saw your bot um, and I don't, I can't diagnose it, but I, but, but I do feel that any decent restaurant um, worth its salt should be able to create a profitable uh, Facebook chatbot because I think it's a perfect industry for bots, um, and yeah. it's 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 um, admirable to begin with that you're that uh, you're able to get a a restaurant that you a lot of these restaurants are more sort of sort of immured in their traditional marketing approaches to to experiment with in the first place. But here's what I would do. Um, obviously, if you're if you're building out a Facebook me uh, campaign. Um, Facebook Messenger campaign, you want to be targeting within a location of the restaurant that people are are going to. Um, gender targeting works. Um, age targeting works. So speak to the, speak to the um, to the restaurant and, and find out like, well, who are your customers? And like, they'll be like, uh, men and women all ages. Well, well, no, that's okay, but that's not the real really the question. It's like, who makes up the majority of your most valuable customers, right? So are you you're not looking for you're not looking for rules to which there are no exceptions, right? You're looking for um, trends. And you might end up paying more, you might end up nailing down your demographics. So it'll, it'll be like, okay, maybe you want to bid more from females between 24 and 40, right? That might be like a, a sweet spot customer for this restaurant. Um, or families or whatever it may be. And you might see your, your cost per lead increase. And that's okay, right? Because you don't, your, your, your ultimate goal is not to have the lowest possible cost per lead. That's never a goal, right? That's never anybody's goal. Your ultimate goal is to generate the most amount of dollars for the least amount of upfront advertising cost. And oftentimes um, people are so hesitant to let a campaign run that has a higher CPL um, just because just just on the basis of it having a higher CPL, even though that they're gonna end up having a higher ROAS. So first thing is don't be afraid to narrow your Facebook targeting, potentially see an increase in cost per lead or cost per contact added to MobileMonkey um, because there's a very good chance that by doing so, you'll also increase your revenue, increase your conversion rate, and ultimately increase your return on ad spend, which is the which is the goal. Um, now, for the bot itself, a restaurant's a very good opportunity for a giveaway. Um, I, I don't want to go into in too much detail because that will eat up the next 45 minutes, but if you, if you, um, if you don't have if you haven't bought the uh, Mobile Monkey's virtual all-access pass, um, do so, 
and Virginia could put a link because I don't, I don't have a link to that. Um, but you'll be able to see in my last lecture, I speak for a, a probably a good 20, 30 minutes on, on building out a sheet that you should present to your client that will predict that incorporates the value of the giveaway. So like, meaning you might go to the restaurant owner, your client, and, and he'll be like, no, I don't give away free meals. Like I cook these meals, I pay for my meals. This is my, this is my bread and butter. Um, you know, nothing, there's no, there's no free, no free lunches. And then you'll say, well, okay, slow down. You also work hard for your money. And my job as your account manager is to maximize, you know, the, the distance your advertising dollars go and take a look at this template, this predictive outlook, the cost of a, of a, of a, of a dinner, a steak dinner for five, your cost, not the cost of a customer, but your cost is, you know, $75 on average. And we're going to now earn an exponential exponentially more than that by offering that as a giveaway. Um, so if you do meet resistance, there is a very good approach to speaking to clients about that because I've also met resistance, um, emotion, not, not, not rational resistance, totally emotional resistance to a giveaway because like business owners don't want to give away their things for free. Like they'd almost, they'd almost rather spend money than give away something for free. It's just irrational. Um, Unless there are there are exceptions. If you're a luxury brand where where giving away something for free could hurt your reputation, that that's that's a fair exception. But in most cases, like no, your restaurant the restaurant's not a luxury brand. So um, you offer something like once a week, a family of three are gonna, is going to come and eat eat for free, right? Anything they want on the menu, and it's worthwhile to spend to invest a little bit more in the giveaway to give to offer a giveaway that's very very compelling because you're only giving away one a week or you could do one a day. Like it's, it's you, the more, the better, like the, the more valuable the giveaway is the better and use an analysis to actually predict whether or not the, the, the cost of your, of what you're giving away is going to be worth it. And you could do that pretty easily. Um, and you also use the losers to you, you market to the losers too. So let's say you, you, you're getting now a thousand new contacts a week on, into mobile monkey. You're picking one winner a week. You ask that one winner, you gotta, you gotta milk, you gotta milk both segments. So the winner gets, you ask them to, to share on social media, put it on their Facebook. Here's a link that you, that you're going to this restaurant and you want a free coupon. Your whole, your, the whole family is going out for free, right? Fantastic. That that's going to bring in a lot of customers. And then you take all the losers who didn't win the coupon and say, well, for all of you who were participating in our in our contest, here's a 10% off coupon that's valid for the next seven days on our entire menu. Um, and now what you've done is you've generated more contacts, right? Like I I, I, I always make this distinction with 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 um with giveaway campaigns. You shouldn't expect to see an increase in conversion rate, and that's part of the pitch. There's no reason to assume. I'm not saying it can't happen, but there's no outright reason to assume that a greater percentage of your contacts are going to convert and show up at the restaurant who, who came into your contact list through a giveaway campaign but lost than any other campaign that generated a list of contacts on Mobile Monkey, right? Like I don't see any compelling reason to say one of those groups should have a higher conversion rate. But the, the main thing is you're gonna have a much lower cost per contact because if somebody's scrolling through their Facebook feed, and they see a generic ad for a restaurant in town. I'm like, oh, like, look, it's a new restaurant and we have really good steak. Okay, it's a great ad, but it's less compelling than if somebody's scrolling through their Facebook feed and say, like, once a week, this restaurant, steakhouse, or whatever it is in the neighborhood, two miles, you know, uh, open late, family friendly, pet friendly, is giving away a free coupon once a week for your entire, no restrictions, no blackout dates, anything on the menu, come eat for free. And all you have to do is click the link respond to our respond to us in messenger and you'll be entered automatically um, into the running so that's a lot more compelling so your click through rate will be higher your cost per contact will, will be will be lower people the people will be much more likely and motivated to actually engage with the bot and you don't need and that's another thing that people don't always realize by the way I'm I'm, I'm if you don't tell me to shut up I'm just gonna keep talking <laughs> well you know that it was very compelling to watch your presentation at the last summit about the contest and the power of the giveaway. Um, there's uh, some good questions actually that I had lined up here I wanted to ask okay. about with good. a giveaway which relates to, does the giveaway offer, should it be related to your business? Is it more powerful that way? Or can it be you know, an iPad or whatever it is? Does that have any impact? Um, it's, a, it's a really good question and like my natural response is just say, of course it should be related to your business. Um, because that just seems like the logical gut reaction, but I don't necessarily know if that's the case. I think you mm -hmm. have to just give people what they want. 
Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully your products and services are, are what people want. Um, but oftentimes like your products and services are, are like very niche. And if you want to really just generate a high volume of, of, of engagement, you might have to offer, offer something more universally appealing. So for example, um, I've done a lot of giveaways with my own courses and content. And I found that like, if I offer like a free landing page review or, or you know, which is very relevant to my product or service, it's not as appealing as a $400 or $500 Amazon gift card, right? Because you're, you're just, or, or an iPad, which is not as, right. which is not relevant to what I do at all. Um, and, and also sometimes you don't really have an offering to give away. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, like it's true too. A real, realtor or something like that. Exactly, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like if you're a realtor, you're a plumber, you're a, you're a trucking company, um, it's not so simple to, to figure out a giveaway. I mean, you could do like a coupon code, a discount code, but it's not so straightforward to be, um, mm -hmm. to, to be doing a giveaway or something like that. Yeah, so it's not, so, but my point is that even if it's totally n irrelevant, right, it's still worth running these giveaways um, with something that has more of a universal appeal because the whole point of the giveaway is getting is, is significantly decreasing your cost per contact. And the, and the follow-up point is that once people have these contacts in Mobile Monkey, you could send out these chat blasts and you could send out drip campaigns for free um, on an ongoing basis like email marketing used to be. So like there, there really should be a focus when people are looking at Mobile Monkey and chatbots at what is my cost per contact in my niche, like per contact on my list. Like that's a very important metric to focus on. When you started your agency, how did you get those first leads? How did you start the momentum going? Like, what does it look like to get your boots on the ground and start pounding the pavement and start, you know, um, finding clients? Okay, it's a good question. I get this question a lot, um, and it's and it's a question I typically um, it it's hard it's hard to answer in a, in a in like a simple way. But what I what I found is that most people don't like the way I answer this question mm. because it's not really what people are looking to hear. Like I think that I think people want to hear well like there must be some there must be something that you found that none of us know about that generates high value clients to a marketing agency. And like what is that secret? And I'm not saying that that secret doesn't exist because to to say something doesn't exist means I'd have to have explored every inch of the of the universe and and know with certainty it doesn't exist. But all I could say is that I don't know okay. it if it exists. I haven't found it. So when I started the company, um, and like you know, I'm really thankful that now we're able to work with very high value clients. Um, so our clients include uh, Forbes magazine, AMC uh, Television Network, um, International Culinary Center, you know, and a lot of other large clients that don't have as much name recognition. But when I first started the company, um, my friend's father was my first client and we helped him with his Yelp listing. He was a dentist. And then my own father was our second client. It was like a pity client. He's like, I helped him with a LinkedIn page. I did anything for anybody that would offer to pay me anything. Okay. That's like the best. Okay. That's really the best first advice. There's nothing that's beneath you. Um, and, I, and it has to obviously has to be somewhat relevant to what I wanted to do. So I, I wanted to be in digital advertising. So, okay, LinkedIn, I helped you with a LinkedIn page. I built you Squarespace websites. I built Yelp pages, like really super simple, just starting out learning all this stuff. Um, and there was nothing, not only was nothing beneath me, but, but I don't, I didn't manage those projects in any different way than I manage campaigns for clients who are spending six, seven figures on their ad campaigns through our agency today. Like the, the level of attention, my attention to, my level of attention to the clients, um, my, the, how much I cared about my product being the best that I could possibly produce, um, the level of respect I had for my client's own money. Like none of that has changed without, when, when I was working for really next to nothing, um, probably what would have amounted to a 30th of the minimum wage in America per hour if you looked at my hours and what I was charging for the early work. So that was the first step, right? And it's like a very, very difficult and unpleasant attitude to adopt. Like there's nothing beneath you and there's no amount of money that's too little in the beginning, right? And that's not easy. It's not, e it's not easy right. to work under those conditions. It's not pleasant at all. Emotionally, psychologically, physically, it's not pleasant. But that's how, that's how it was for me in the beginning. Um, and then I spent a lot of time on copying what other people were doing well. Um, and that's something which is also maybe not so admirable to talk about or to admit, but but it's what worked. Like I spent a lot of time researching 
other successful agencies, how they presented their material, what content they use. And I, and I, and I went about that with like a very healthy respect for their accomplishments and, and like admiring other people who have done this and had, had done this successfully. And I, was, and I would try to copy pixel for pixel a landing page. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make mine look exactly like that. And I wanna learn about what they're doing so, so I can make it better one day. But I, I can't figure out what was good and what I could improve on unless I copy it at least something or at least I do as something as similar as possible to somebody else. So I spent a lot of time um, making my website and landing page and material and sales pitch basically um, copy. And I, I remember getting one email <laughs> for a long time ago from a company where I basically copied their exact same pricing page. Um, this, mm. was, and this, was, this was when I was still alone by myself. I had no employees, like no one working with me. Um, and I got a, I got an, I really copied their exact pricing packages. I used their names. I used the deliverables. It was really pathetic, but, but I still think it's a good idea. Like I, it's, it's, but, and I, but I don't regret it. It's pathetic, but I don't regret it. So like they got, they emailed me. They're like, they're like, what the hell are you doing? Like, that's our page. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, funny. Well, well, sue me. Um, and so other people are saying that's how it is listening learning trying growing yeah copying yeah. is so and and the, so and so started. yeah and then once i copied i understood what was good and what was bad about what i was copying and i figured out how can i do this better and then over time you do that you do enough difficult work unpleasant work but you do it well um and i always and i never i never like and i'm not pat, i'm not patting myself on the back i'm just saying how it is like i failed more times than i've succeeded over the last five years but um just like I've always had the attitude that I, that I appreciate any client willing to give me any money for any amount of work like that, that I've, I'm also very aggressive in my own growth and I hold my, my team to a very, very high level of accountability, but I still have a, a very strong sense of appreciation for any client. You know, like you don't have to give me your business. Um, you don't have to give me your money. Um, there's other people that, that could do what I do just as well or better. And that sense of appreciation, impacts many, many different areas of building a business. Um, and clients will come. I think Jeff Bezos calls it like staying in day one or day zero, right? Like yeah, just yeah, so that I definitely, that there's that that concept, not to not to say my name and his name in the same sentence, that's 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 utterly absurd. But, um, so there's so there's that, which is a big part. And then, and then creating content, that was the next piece. So you have, and this, this is something which is very, this is very important for your bots. Um, that it was so it was that attitude that hard work there was one winter where where i couldn't i wasn't getting any leads from my website I, I was spending money on my own ad campaigns on google ads i signed a couple small clients but i couldn't afford the ads because it was very expensive and as much as google likes to say it's like a level playing field it's not and we can talk about that on another time but i would i printed out brochures physical brochures that took me like a week to make um it was like 30 pages long about all the different things i could do full color like it was, ex and it was expensive at the time. I didn't have yeah. money to print out, you know, 700 brochures, spiral bound the works. And I walked around all these different little towns on Long Island. I drove to Huntington, I drove to Cold Spring Harbor, and I just went door to door to door to door in, in freezing cold. I think it was snowing, um, handing out brochures. And I think like one person called me back. Um, it wasn't a good, wasn't, was not a good marketing <laughs> technique for me. Oh, but man. the point is, that it was like, it was just, it was just trying. It was just like, it was like it's it's okay. I'll 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 walk around for for four days door to door and see what happens. And like that's and anyway, but in the snow like, uphill, absolutely. Yeah, and then and then there was the content. So people also like don't. I don't think cold calling or cold emailing is an effective way of generating clients. Um, again, I'm not okay. saying it can't be done, and I'm not saying no one's doing it successfully. I it's not something that I would recommend trying. But creating content is going to be very important, and it's also going to be very, very hard. So all of our best clients, now a lot of them come through referrals. And that, and as you start getting a little bit of a good track record and you have a good handful of clients, you should be forthright in asking for a referral because you'll never get a referral unless you ask. Like that's another mm -hmm. mistake people make. Like, oh, you do good work. Very nice. You'll tell his friend. Like that's not going to happen. No, they don't. No one's thinking about you. Like, like your clients who are paying you, A, they're not thinking about you or your business. B, they don't want to, they, they're not like incentivized to share your attention with another business. So you have to really be forthright with asking for a referral and potentially asking multiple times. Um, so there's that. So referrals will come, but it, they'll come eventually if you ask for them and you're, and you're respectful, but, but specific. 
but also content. So like my courses, my 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 webinars, um, blog posts, like content works. So people will be exposed to your yeah. content. They'll develop a sense that you know what you're talking about. So you gotta specialize in a niche. And this is advice that most people probably have heard already, but most people haven't done it because it's so unbelievably difficult to create good content and it takes long, it takes a long time. It takes creating content itself is difficult, but you have to do it consistently with no results for a year. Like who could do that? Like who wants to do that? Um, and I mean, I think if you look at WordStream and Mobile Monkey, like you guys are very content heavy. The the summits, the the, the workshops, the the Facebook group, the blogs, like it's it's it really drives a huge amount of of emotional validity when a customer calls you like if you think about it like this like if you call a business say hey can i manage your 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 facebook messenger marketing for you like goodbye or you write a really good insightful post about five facebook messenger techniques with specific results with case studies um with a financial analysis and some people see that that will go so far for you in terms of getting people to think about who you are, who your company is, to want to follow your posts, to want to follow your information. Um, so again, like I always talk about, create, I always talk about creating content, but but I always feel it gets ignored because like most people don't do it. Um, which is, by the way, for the for the who who is that, who's ever listening to this, for the two or three percent of you that you that are going to do it, it's a huge opportunity because if you know that most people are not going to create content, you have less, comp you, you, the only competition you're really up against is yourself. It's like, it's just overcoming your inability to, to put in that level of effort and, and consistent hard work. But the, the good, on the flip side, the good part is most of your colleagues and most of the people that are going to be competing with you in your space are not going to really do it. So you have, you have, the world is open to you. It's, it's not a saturated market in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. and it can be done well. So that's, that's how, that's how, that's how we got our first clients. And, um, we're still a young company and we're, you know, we're not a big company, but, and we try and we still work very hard, but it, the success will come. It just takes a lot of consistent, unpleasant, hard work. There you go. That's, that's the truth. And the content, it's so hard to sometimes prioritize that when you have a number of other things facing you, like, should I try to send out this uh, proposal or should I right. um, create a demo here? But uh, if you can demonstrate what a successful outcome looks like um, based on anything that you've done in the past, then um, that can speak very loudly and could be a tool for everything going forward. So Yeah, for sure. Great, great advice. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of comments here. I, if you have a question, do leave a comment. Uh, I can see them and we can uh, chat about them with Isaac. I see Isaac is the man. Just copy Amazon. They already spent the money on R&D and UI. Absolutely. Um, it is uh, giving away like free meals or something. Is that going to be attracting the people that just want something for nothing? Um, is that a question in reference to the, the, the restaurant discussion? They, like, Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I don't think so. I don't think that's a that's that's. I don't think you should be concerned about that. Like, you'll you'll attract some people that want want something for nothing. But but let me let me clue you in on something. Everybody wants something for nothing. Like, there's nothing. This it's a very it's a getting a good deals as a universal appeal. Yes, it's true that on the flip side, people also have a greater sense of satisfaction when you earned for when you when you've earned something or when you've paid for something. But at at the same time, you know, the human being could have uh, contradictory psychological forces, but we also love getting a deal. We love getting something for free. Even more so, we love getting something for free when we know that other people are paying for it, right? Um, that There's nothing more exciting than that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, human nature is not always, human nature is not always a beautiful thing, but, um, so I think you'll attract some people that want a free meal, but great. So you're going to give away a winner, but people need to eat. People are still going, going out to eat. People are still going to restaurants. So you generate all the people who didn't get a free coupon and you give them a 10 or 15% off coupon if they come within three days or whatever it is. So no, I don't, I don't think you should be too overly concerned about the type of people you're attracting. At the very least, test it and see what happens, right? That's the beautiful thing about digital marketing um, with, with Messenger and bot building is you could test so many different things with relative with relatively low risk and you'll you'll come out ahead. Not every test will be successful, but that's but a failed test is also successful. It's it's, it's also a successful mm -hmm. thing. Just you've learned something that didn't work, right? And and companies pay a lot of money to find out things that don't work. 
preach comment from the audience yes um you mentioned that you stole the pricing page from somebody else right in your industry another agency uh, yeah. at one point which is yeah. very great story so um what are some ways to price bot services and i know there's different kinds of so maybe mm -hmm. you know you're running ads for somebody or if you're um creating like a, a a chatbot that will reside on a website to answer FAQs. So there's different kinds of services related to bots. I'm not even sure what avenue to take with this, but yeah. um, what are some of the different models you think are, are viable pricing uh, packaging? Options? Sure. So this is a this is a very loaded and complicated topic, um, but let's try to get into it a little bit, um, and we'll see we'll see where it goes. Um, so there's a few. And this would, this would be easier for me if I had slides just to keep my thoughts in order, but I'll do the best I, I, that I can. There's a few different things you, you want to sort of figure out first when it comes to pricing. Uh, at the very high level is like, do you want to have fixed pricing that you, that let's say you could post on your site? Or do you want to take down the pricing from your site and, and price out each job individually? Um, because how you approach that makes a big impact on sort of how this tree goes down and how it branches out into, into different models you could use. So, and I don't know the right answer to that question because um, we started off, or like I don't know if there's clearly a better way one or the other. I could tell you that our agency currently does not have any pricing published on our website for digital marketing services. Um, but in the beginning, in the beginning we did. For the first two and a half, three, two and a half years we were in business, we had specific set pricing packages. And I do feel that having clear pricing was part of our appeal to smaller businesses. Um, mm -hmm. We took it down because I did some testing and I realized that at, at the point where we were in our size and our growth, like we were able to um, earn more revenue by pricing out jobs. And like, you know, sort of to conceptualize this, you have commoditized pricing. So when you have, let's say, Facebook bot building services, um, we're going to be building two bots per month for in this package with um, you know, a maximum 50 different Q&A items with you know, four different sub-segments of pages, that, you know, different pages a bot can go to. Um, and you can come up with some specific list of de deliverables in, in this package and then in this package. And there's all these different psychology of pricing packages, right? You have the decoy, like one, just a, um, a side note, if you're gonna do the pre, oh, nice dog. Is that a cat, a dog? <laughs> That's oh, a cat, it looks like a dog. It's a big cat because it was the, the it's a little funky the the screen. Yeah, right, um, right. What's his or her, her name? That's Harley. Harley, cute. Yeah. Um, so you wanna you wanna have a decoy, right? So you wanna you wanna have let's say three packages. So you have the cheap package, which no one wants the cheap package because no one wants to be the cheapest package. And then you have the middle package, which has a lot of value. So let's say your cheap package right. starts at you know one ninety nine a month, and then your middle package is five ninety nine a month, and it has all these deliverables. Then your third package is like two grand a month. It's it's way more expensive than the middle package, but it has like one extra feature. And like mm -hmm. the idea of the decoy is like everyone looks at the, the one extra feature and they're like, well, which sucker is paying two grand a month to get that one extra thing? That makes the five hundred dollar deal look so much better. Especially because remember, like there's that human nature that if you think that some other suckers were fleeced and bought the really expensive package with one extra feature, they'll be like, "Wow, I'm getting a really good deal for this middle package." So, like, just that's just a um, a basic concept in in, in pricing tiers. But um, so you have your set packages, and we did that for a long time, and then we took it off, and and that sort of commoditized, meaning it's like the same thing over and over again. Um, and there, there, that will have an appeal to small businesses that are looking at it and be like, okay, like I know that I'm going to get honest pricing. I could hold them accountable for the deliverables, but there's a lot of downsides too. The main downside is you you can no longer really price the job, which what I call is like a consultative approach to your services, which is like, okay, how big of a company are you? How excited are you about this? What type of communication you're going to expect from us. Um, what's the growth potential, scalability potential? Because like, if this is a big company that's scaling, we'll, we'll decrease our rates a little bit. Um, um, do, we, do you as the provider, as the vendor, really believe in this product or service, in which case you'll want to discount your, your base fee and, and do some sort of bonus structure, which is like really by far the best way to go is bonus structures with, with, a, with a slightly discounted base fee. Um, but anyway, so you have to sort of decide what you want to do first. Like, are, are you going to be, a, are you going to take a consultative approach and price out each job and each client separately, you know, probably within a framework. Um, 
but there's a lot of different, you could have a, a broad framework, but there's a lot of different permutations, or do you wanna take a commoditized approach and list your prices and have pre-built pricing packages with pre-built deliverables, which has its pros and cons. Okay, you figure that out. Um, a couple other things I would talk about before going into like the different bonus models, but you wanna think about a, a setup fee, right? A lot of people have asked me in the past, like, would you charge a setup fee? So we charge, we typically charge a setup fee, and I think your setup fee could be up to the cost of the first month's management fee, let's say. So if you're charging a client 1,500 bucks a month, it's reasonable to charge a client a $1,500 setup fee, which is a one-time fee for month one. But you have to really describe just two things. A, you have to make it clear to your client why you're charging a setup fee. And B, you have to actually do the additional work that you're claiming is the reason why you're charging the setup fee in the first place. Um, those are those, that's important. So, like we tell our clients, well, like listen, onboarding a new client is a pretty intensive process. Um, we're doing a lot of competitive research, which will send you like we're, like we're going to show you like some very impressive spreadsheets on the competitive landscape of your industry. Um, we're going to be sitting around researching and thinking about different ideas for the structure of of messenger bots or other campaigns. Um, we're going to be learning about the advertising footprint of of some of your competitors and how they've changed their ads over time. We need to just learn your industry. We need to put together some financial analysis like what is your profit margin on products? Like what are um, what products and services are you trying to sell? What's the break even cost for a lead or for a contact? Um, setting up the messenger bot systems and structures takes time. So like, you know, you could charge a setup fee. That's what I'm saying. Now, if you, if you sign a big deal and you get a big client, you might want to waive the setup fee because um, if it's a client that's big for you, the client knows it. Like the client knows they're a big client for you, um, and you also want to convey that th that for you, this client's a big client. And the goalpost will hopefully change over time. Like as you grow and as your agency grows, what's considered a big client will change, and that's fine. Um, but there's just a thing like clients tend to know like where they stand. Um, as in terms of their value to your business. Um, mm -hmm. It just comes through no matter whether or not it's it's outright um, addressed, let's say. So you want to, um, you might want to waive a setup fee. And in, So in when that, you, just a couple quick questions from the audience. When you charge a setup fee, do you charge the monthly first, uh, the fee for the first month also? And I would think yes, unless you decide you, you're waiving the setup fee, yeah? Yeah, so we charge the setup fee and the first month's fee upfront. Um, it used to be almost all of our clients paid by credit card, um, which was great for us, even, even with the 3% fee, and it's great for the client too. But now, since we're dealing with a lot of companies that are larger, they have invoicing departments and, and they, we invoice them manually, but either way, we invoice upfront for the work. So we invoice for the setup fee and the first month's management fee upfront. And then in month two, if there's a bonus payment, it's, it's, it's for, if, if there's a bonus payment from month one, we add that to the second month's invoice and so on and so forth like that. So the setup fee is the, the setup fee is charged right away um, with the with the first yeah. month fee. Now there's a couple other things that sometimes clients will push back, and if you know a lot of clients will be trying to negotiate a deal, they'll be like, "Could you waive the setup fee?" So we're like, "No, I can't waive the setup fee." But if you commit to three months, I could split the setup fee over the course of three months. If you commit to six months, we could waive the setup fee, um, something like that. Now I know people are going to be asking about legal contracts and this and that. Avoid all of that for a couple of reasons. One, well, this is, okay. First of all. It takes too much time. Second of all, if a client wants to stop paying you, you're not going to really have any. You're not going to have too much recourse anyway as a freelancer, digital marketer. Um, even if you do have recourse, it's going to be more time and more money to try to extract money from the client. Third, you don't want your clients stuck contractually in a relationship that's poisonous for that's not working for them or for you because that's a poisonous mm -hmm. relationship. Um, it no good will come from it. That's three. For 99% of clients, anyway, if if things are going well, they're not leaving. Like out of I've we've we've worked we've had over 500 clients over the last five years, and maybe three of them were doing really well and left because their whole plan from the get go was to find an agency, get things going really well, and then fire them. But anyway, that's still okay because we're and, that, and that's my fifth point is agencies are not set up to lose money ever. On a client, right? So the only the only grounds there is to make a a long term contract structure to your proposals, and I guess this is a different topic in pricing. Also, it's like avoid long term contracts, right? It might sound cool or sound professional. Clients don't like it, and they don't make any sense unless you're one of the top four holding companies. And maybe there, and maybe in those instances, there really is an upfront investment on the on the agency side. But and I tell this to my clients. I say like. 
and, and by the way, another, another, I told you there's a lot to say on pricing. Clients love honesty and transparency. That's A, and B, clients wanna know that you're successful. Clients wanna know you're making money. No client wants to work with somebody who's not successful. Successful, like people have this notion that, like, oh, I can't, I can't ever convey to my clients that we're profitable, that that I'm making money. Like, no, it's not true. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be further from the truth. Clients like to know that you're successful, that you're making money, that you're doing well. You know, clients don't want to see you frivolously spending money left and right because then they're like, okay, well, I'm obviously paying you too much, but they want to know that you're successful. Um, so I tell clients that we don't do month to month contracts because first we're set up to earn profit from you on day one, right? We're never, if, if you fire us after month one, we still made money. Like that's how a typical digital advertising agency is structured. We're not investing upfront additional costs. We've had r rare cases where a client, like a large client asked us for certain things that we had to invest our own money in. But in those cases, it was so clear that the, re the relationship was gonna be strong. Um, mm -hmm. but, but really you tell your client, like, listen, like we're, we're profitable every month. So uh, if you wanna, if you want to commit, give me like a verbal written commitment, which is not contractually bound to six months of service, because you know that's what it's going to take to get these you know campaigns optimized. Maybe we'll waive the setup fee. If you want to commit to three months, we'll spread it out. And I've done that a handful of times, and we've never had an issue with the client, you know, taking two months of work and two thirds of a setup fee and leaving. Like that's not how it that's that's not how it's gonna go. But those are some instances where you could help the client defray the costs of an upfront setup fee over the course of a few months if you ask them for like a variable written commitment for three months. Anyway, that's how I do it. So okay. I don't charge I don't I don't ever make a contract. I've never been sued and I've never been I've never been sued. I've never sued. And okay. you know, getting yeah, getting litigious is not good for your business. It's not good for you. It's not good for your reputation. It doesn't it's just in most cases never gonna work out well for you. Um so avoid trying to lock any con clients into long-term contracts. Um, if the if you're providing good work and your results are good and your and and your services are professional and your work is a high-quality product, your clients are going to stay with you. Like you, yeah, there are exceptions, but by and large, your clients are going to stay with you. Um, so that's the setup fee. Now, so do you want to get into the bonus models? Because yeah. I'm sure that there are people who are on the edge of their seat, excited to hear a yes. little bit about how to make that you know work for them. Yeah. So one more, th uh, two more quick things before I get into the bonus models, and I promise I'll make them quick because I have to go pretty soon. Also, um, one is a base fee, right? A lot of clients, because our industry sort of revolves around percentage of ad spend um, or brackets, and I'm going to touch upon both of those in a very brief minute, but people ask me about a base fee and I think you should charge a base fee. So here's how I conceptualize it. If you're a freelancer um, on your own and maybe you have some help or some contractors, I would say like, look look, look at the range of $6.99 a month as a base, right? So maybe you're charging 10% of ad spend, but if a client's spending three grand a month, you're not gonna charge them 300. You're gonna make it very clear that our base fee is 6.99 to get involved with building bots for you. Like that's the minimum. And you, and you could tell your clients, that if, in, if another freelancer gives you a cheaper quote, um, you should be weary of how much personal time they're actually able to put in for you on a monthly basis um, and getting paid so little, right? So you could, you know, something like that. Now, if you're a large, if you're a company that's looking to scale and do a lot of work with a lot of contractors um, and really primarily targeting small businesses, then you could low, you could actually, it's a little counterintuitive, but you, but I would even lower your potential base fee to something like three ninety nine a month. Because as you scale and as you have more clients and as more of your contractors or yourself could do more work, you're able to spread that work out more and um, you're able to, to earn the same amount of profit for less, for a lower fee. If you're an agency that's looking to scale, deal with higher value clients, not necessarily like a huge volume of clients, smaller volume, smaller volume of clients, maybe you're, maybe you're not taking every business opportunity that comes your way, um, then look at a sixteen to, to sixteen hundred to two thousand dollar a month minimum base fee. Okay, so those are base fees and you should have one. Because you don't want to be stuck getting paid ninety nine dollars a month from a client. Unless That's again very unless you're just starting out and and nine dollars a month. You're taking enough. everything. Yeah. Taking everything. <laughs> get, just get as much work done as possible. Um Okay, so now that you have your base fee, so now you wanna talk about the structure of your fees. So there's two basic ways you could structure your fees. You could do a fixed percentage of spend. Now, this if you're building bots and you're not running campaigns, it's separate, then you need to charge based on a, on a, on a, on a set of deliverables, right? So you could scale how much you charge based on how many bots you're building, how advanced the bots are. Um, but I would, I would predict, and I could be wrong about this, but I would predict, I'm sorry about the noise in the background, they're doing some construction, but I would predict that most clients that you're signing up for bot services will probably be interested in running 
Facebook Messenger ad campaigns, because that's really the primary, one of the primary ways of getting um, contacts, a lot of contacts really quickly onto your lists. Um, so if you're running Facebook Messenger ad campaigns that are that are click to messenger campaigns that are generating contacts in mobile monkey, then you could charge one of two ways. You could charge a fixed percentage of spend and you could start in that 10% range as budget scales go down to nine, eight, seven, six, five. You know, we have clients that are spending well into the six figures, not on Facebook messenger bots yet, um, where they started off, you know, if there's, you know, let's do, if you're spending 200 to $300,000 a month, our fee will be 8% of spend. 300 to $500,000 a month, your fee is 6% of spend, and you go down. Um, you award the client's increase in spend with a decrease in, in fixed management fee. So that's what I call a graduated fixed management fee. But you could also just have, okay, okay we charge you 7% of spend, 8% of spend, 10% of spend. Um, I don't think it's normal to be charging more than 12, 15% of spend, excluding your base fee. Meaning if a client's spending $1,000, you could tell them out front, well, we're, we're still gonna charge you $700 a month, right? Which is 70% base fee, uh, fee, but like as budget typically scales, like, you know, 12 to 15%, if it's a very complex account is really the, 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 the cap. But anyway, I rarely charge a fixed percentage of spend for a couple of reasons. One is if you're charging a fixed percentage of spend, you as the agency do not know exactly what you're gonna be billing your client on a month to month basis because you're waiting for the spend to come in. The client doesn't know what they're gonna pay you and neither of those things are desirable. The client wants to know exactly what they're going to pay you. You want yeah, to know exactly what you're going to pay. Dependability. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like you just you just want it out of you want the management fees out of sight out of mind, especially to your mm -hmm. client as much as possible. For you too, but especially for your client. Um the other problem with doing it that way is that you can't bill it's or it's harder to bill at the first of the month. It's harder to bill before you do the work right. that way. Um because you don't know how much is going to be spent. So what we do and what we've been doing really since the beginning and or close to since the beginning, and clients really like this, are brackets. Um, so we do a fixed management fee within brackets. So I'll say something like, okay, up to $15,000 a month in spend, your fee is $2,500 a month. 15 to $35,000 a month, your fee is $3,500 a month. 35 to 50, your fee is this a month. So if you increase your spend a little bit, you're not charging your client anymore. If you're decreasing the spend a little bit, the client's not paying you any less. And it works out very, very well for a few reasons. One is if you're doing a fixed percentage of spend system and you go to your client and say, listen, like this, this campaign for this remarketing campaign, getting list our contacts into mobile monkeys working really well. I suggest we spend an extra $2,000 next month doing it. So the client always has this defense mechanism that you're trying to right. make more money off them. Um, and, right. that, and it's unfortunate because usually you're not, that's not the case. Like you actually want to help your client's business grow, but like you can't avoid that feeling of like, are you trying to squeeze me for an extra 200 bucks a month now? So by having these fixed brackets where you have 5,000 padding up, 5,000 padding down, that doesn't really happen. It's like, yeah, I, I'm that's not going to make any more money off you. I just think it's a good idea. And on the flip side, if the client comes to you and says, you know what, I want to pull $300 from the budget this month, it doesn't impact your fee either. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the and, and of course you could charge at the first of the month. So that's a very, very, um, it's a really good system. And what we do with brackets is we're like, we don't, if a client goes over the bracket one month, we don't, we don't graduate them into the higher bracket. We, it has to be significant. Like we're not going to penny pinch. Mm -hmm. So if they're, if they're basically three, four months in a row or two, three months in a row, they're spending two to three to $5,000 above their last bracket, then we'll say, okay, things are going great. We're going to start charging you the next bracket. Right. Um, so the bracketed system is very good. Okay. So now you've, now you figured out you're not, you're not doing any long-term contracts. You figured out that you're going to charge a base fee. You figured out you're going to charge a setup fee. You've decided whether you're going to have commoditized pricing or consultative pricing. Um, and you figured out whether or not you want to do some sort of fixed percentage of spend system or you want to do a bracketed system. But now the best part about it is you have to figure out how you're going to get a bonus. And bonuses are the way to really make more money. Um, provided that provided that at least 50% of the time you could hit your bonuses. Um, and, that, and you should design bonuses and where around that your ability to do so. Um, so maybe if you're just starting out and you're just learning and you're just getting your first few clients, it might it might overly complicate things for the bonus, but certainly once you have your feet on the ground a little bit, um, there's no better way of scaling your agency 
revenue wise because it doesn't require one ounce of that extra work. You're just coming up with a really smart way of making more money from your clients. So it's the most effective way that I found to start scaling the revenue you're earning, which is the reason why you're in business. Um, so bonuses basically, conceptually, here's what you're telling a client with a bonus. It's like, listen, you're hiring me to do certain things for you, to get certain results, right? You, you're hiring me to either, and, and every client will hire you for different things. So you're either hiring me to, to decrease a CPA or to get a total, you know, uh, increase our volume of leads, qualified leads, increase our sales, increase our return on ad spend. And by the way, clients could say they want all these things or a combination of these things. And it usually is a combination of some of these things. Or we want to generate more contacts on our marketing lists for Facebook Messenger. Um, so you'll be like, okay, fantastic. We understand your goals. So let's just take one of these for example. Say um, a client wants to generate uh, more, more contacts on a mobile monkey list to, not to exceed a certain cost per contact. Fine, mm -hmm. that's the goal. So you tell your client, okay, your goal is to get, I don't know, a th your goal is to get 10,000 new contacts a month and you're willing to pay $10,000 for those contacts. Um, fine. So. Our management fee, you're paying us a monthly management fee to basically get that those results. Um, if if we generate those results for you, you're, you would feel happy that you hired us, right? That's the emotional um, idea here behind this, the pitch of the bonus. Um, now, if we consistently underperform, then yeah, well, you reserve, you retain the right to fire us at any point, but hopefully we're gonna hit these results and hopefully we're gonna do better. Now, typically we'll be charged, you know, around 10% of spend as a management fee, or even with like, and even in the bracketed system, like we'll usually charge between nine and 13% of the median of the bracket. That's usually how it falls out. So you'll say, you say to your client, in order for us to earn your business over month over month, like we're gonna aim to hit these goals, these 10,000 new contacts a month for $10,000, not to exceed a dollar per contact or whatever it may be. Um, but we wanna really align our goals to exceed those results. Like you'd be happy spending the 10 grand if it generated 10,000 contacts in Mobile Monkey, but we're a good agency, we think we could do better, and we wanna sort of share in, in that success, and it's within your best interest to, to have us wanna share in the success because we're the ones that are gonna be behind generating that success. So you, sit, you, so you tell your client, okay, we're gonna discount our base fee by 25%. So if, instead of charging a 10% of spend or 10% of the median of the bracket, we're gonna now charge 7% or 6% or whatever it is. Um, and we're gonna put some skin in the game. We believe in your product. We believe in what you sell. We believe in our capabilities. And we're willing to take a hit on the guaranteed fee in exchange for the opportunity to earn a performance-based bonus only if we exceed your goal, right? So you tell your clients like, like and here's one example of a bonus. You say, okay, say we spend $10,000 and we generate 20,000 contacts. Right, so we generated contacts at 50 cents a contact. You, we want to take a 20, 30, 40, 50 percent commission on, on the savings. And what does savings means? Savings is is your own definition. You, you, we all agreed that a dollar per contact would be considered um, really successful, right? So you spend 10 grand on on getting. On twenty thousand contacts, we're going to earn a fifty percent commission, and on top of our base fee, we're going to get paid five thousand dollars because there was ten thousand dollars in savings. You would have been, and this is this. Is, you have to be able to describe this stuff to your clients in English because you can't just show them some formulas and expect them to be all excited. So you tell your clients, based on your own pre pre stated results, you would have you would have had uh, you would have had been willing, I guess, to spend. $20,000 to generate these 20,000 contacts because that would have been a dollar contact. Instead, we got the 20,000 contacts for $10,000. So we saved you essentially 10 grand. We're gonna earn a commission on that as a bonus, 50% of that, $5,000 bonus payment on top of our base fee. So the bonus is a beautiful thing. One, it's, it's infinitely scalable because as long as results improve, your bonus payment can increase. And, and we found that with some of our larger clients, the bonus payment has regularly exceeded our base fee. Um, so not only has it exceeded the entire base fee, it's significantly more than what we had given up. Because um, you, want, you want to sort of give a little bit of a discount, give and take, it makes the negotiation go a lot better. And usually clients love this. If you could, if you could decrease the risk for a client, if you could decrease a base fee and instead have a performance-based bonus, there's no client that I've ever spoken to that wasn't like unbelievably excited to do this. Because yeah. it totally minimizes the risk. Um, and then you, you, 
you're showing the client that you believe in your own capabilities by 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 saying that you plan on earning the money back through a through a bonus, and you're also showing the client that you believe in their products that 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 you believe that these products will actually sell and then you're going to hit the results because it takes two to tango. You have to be good at your job, but the client has to also have a good product that people want to buy. Um, so you're really conveying a lot of belief, just a lot of belief, belief in yourself and belief in the client, which is very positive in the beginning of a relationship. Um, and you're really aligning your goals because oftentimes when you do this percentage of base percentage of fee system, what could happen is, is the agency could be penalized by good performance because as performance increases, as conversion rate increases, as CPA drops, the total amount that you could spend on the on the, on a client's campaign usually goes down too. So all things being equal, if your conversion rate increases, your budget decreases. And if you're only getting paid on budget, then you're going to be penalized as the agency by charging a lower monthly fee after you've increased performance for your client by in, by increasing conversion rate because your your budget all, again, all things being equal, your budget would go down a little bit. Whereas you don't want that and your client doesn't want that. Um, you should be incentivized, even if budget goes down, with a bonus system that if performance increases, you're gonna earn that, that in that in that bonus. And it's very, very important to have the basic targets clear. So in my example, where we want $10,000, 10,000 contacts, that has to be clear. It has to be achievable. Um, I, I, For myself, I don't, I don't set achievable goals, but for clients, you have to set achievable goals or attainable goals. Um, that's another good, that's another just, you know, when you're setting your own goals for your own life and your own business, don't worry if they're attainable or not. But when, when it comes to talking to clients, you have to be a little bit more realistic. So the goals have to be achievable, attainable, and they have to make sense to the client. And the client has to really feel that if I spend $10,000 and I got 10,000 contacts, that would be great. It would be profitable for us, which then makes it zero tension for them to give you a 50, 60% commission bonus on the savings because they, they themselves have determined and have stated that if you're generating 10,000 contacts for $10,000 in spend, that's a great use of our money. And whatever it takes to incentivize you to do better, we will share in those earnings. Um, so it sets you up very well to earn a very sizable commission on the savings. So there's there's a lot of different ways you could do a bonus. That was just a bonus based on, on cost per lead. You know, it cost per lead, cost per contact, cost per whatever conversion result you want. There's also return on ad spend bonuses. There's um, lead volume bonuses. There's overall revenue bonuses. You could build a bonus off of any desirable metric that the client wants. And you can, you can combine different metrics. You could say that we have to hit a certain amount of leads um, in order to, in, we, ha we have to hit a certain volume of leads plus a certain cost per lead in order for a bonus to kick in. And I built a bunch of these bonus templates. I sell them. I sell one bonus template now, but I have mm. a library of five or six more like really advanced templates that are very customizable. They come with charts and, and 12 month outlooks. Um, and people who have been using them really love them. And we use them at our, in our business all the time. So when we bring on new clients now, we almost, and this is relatively new for us, by the way, it's like last year or so. And we try to, in every instance possible, try to incorporate some sort of bonus system into the proposal. Because even if you don't hit the, even if you don't hit the bonus, mm -hmm. the benefits, like the psychological benefits to the relationship are so huge, mm -hmm. where you show your client in the beginning that we're not just in this for a guaranteed base fee until you fire us. Um, and we also value our own, we also value our own money and our own success. And you want to hire people who are serious about their money and their earning potential because they're going to treat your dollars with more seriousness um, and with more earning potential as well. And like, that's the type of agency that your client wants managing their money. So that's what I have to say. It's a very practical about. way to become part of the equation. The team. Exactly. Yeah, the team. Exactly. If people want to dive more into bonus models, the templates that you mentioned, and a lot of the other um, very like, you know, tactical, practical strategies that you were talking about for scaling an agency, you you have that program in the agency overdrive subscription program. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. So, yeah. so um, I'm going to drop yeah. a link in the comments here and Perfect. you can check it out. There's a, a huge discount as well that's available right now, a lifetime deal on agency overdrive, um, which is usually $49 for just $12, $11, uh, 11 bucks a month. And it's usually $49 $11. a month. And um, this is a, um, a, a code that um, limited time because the agency overdrive library is still being built up. I'm adding new videos weekly. Um, and uh, yeah, so it'll be a lifetime discount um, if you guys get in with that with that coupon code.
Yeah, that's an amazing value and amazing deal to be part of the community of growing your agency. There's a ton of agencies, freelancers in Mobile Monkey Island. It's a really exciting and active part of our community. And I'm excited to kind of bring together a lot of content and uh, educational opportunities in the upcoming Marketing Agency Growth Accelerator Summit that Mobile Monkey is hosting on May 16th. Um, you will notice a lot of the brands that are coming together to bring lessons on where to find clients, how to uh, expand your services. Um, Isaac is going to be speaking there as well. So, Looking uh, forward. Yes. Check it out. Go to mobilemonkey.com slash summits. Um, raise your hand if this was the best chatbot chat ever. Uh, right <laughs> <Yes. laughs> High five, Isaac. Thank you so High much five. for joining us. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. Um, and there's, yeah, it's like, it's stuff is endless and it's hard. So you just take everything. I think you just take it step by step, work on one thing at a time. And um, I wish everybody, I wish everybody lots of luck with their clients. And it, yeah. And if, it, and if there's any other questions you have that I didn't answer, drop it in the chat on on the Facebook thread and I'll, and I'll over the weekend at some point, I'll try to get in there a little bit. And if you're not part of Isaac's digital uh, advertising superstars yet, um, that's a Facebook group that you're, is a great you're, you're missing out. Yeah. to be part you're of lots of, yes, cool. Lots of thanks from the audience, lots of hellos. Everybody have a great weekend. Have a great and weekend, everybody. Check you next week in Mobile Monkey Island.